Because you have to understand that we are the children of God. We are the representatives of the kingdom of God on the earth. We are the ones that God has chosen for this day, this time, this season. This life that you are living in is not about you paying your bills. This life that you are living in is not about your career. This life that you are living in is not about you just raising your children, which even though that is important, but that's not your only role. This life is not about what you can accumulate. This life is about being a servant of the most high God. The earth is waiting, it's groaning, it's calling forth the what? The sons of God, because it's the sons of God that can yield authority over Satan on the earth. It's the sons of God that can put the devil in his place. It's the sons of God that can cause the earth uh, to shake and to move according to the will of God. It's the sons of God that can speak to a mountain and it shall be cast into the sea. It's the sons of God that can speak to a fig tree and the fig tree will die. It's the sons of God that can speak to cancer and it will be no more. It's the sons of God that can say, God, let your kingdom come and let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven it's the sons of God that can pray and allow the will of God in heaven to be made manifest on earth so it is to the devil's advantage that you not know and understand that you are a son of the most high God and what does it mean? It does, it's not just something pretty to say. I present my body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to you. What happened to the sacrifice? The sacrifice was drained of blood. The sacrifice was cut into pieces. The sacrifice was lit with fire. Y'all want to talk about being lit? Let's talk about the altar of God. That what does that mean? That means that he's burning you up. That means that with the word, he's confronting your foolishness. But then at the same time with his oil and with his grace, he says, I will confront your foolishness, but I will burn it off of you and then I will pour my oil on you and then I will heal you and then I will restore your mind and then I'll make it like it never happened and then he'll put his anointing on you and then he'll give you a testimony and then he'll give you boldness to speak that testimony and the next thing you do and the next thing you know the devil is afraid and he's running because the one that once was his servant is now 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 walking in dominion and power and authority and stepping on his head glory to God glory to God glory to God because that's what I'm talking about I'm talking to some people that have a past I'm talking to some people that have made some mistakes I'm talking to some unrighteous people that have come in contact with the blood of the lamb and you are now the righteousness of God in Christ and every time you get up out of bed the devil says oh God here we go again you know it's so easy to allow other things to be in the place that rightfully belongs to Jesus. It's so easy to allow fear to sit on that throne of your heart where you feel paralyzed and you feel like you can't move. It's so easy to allow the problems and the things that you see on television, television to make you so angry that it allows anxiety and frustration to sit on the throne of your heart. But I need to remind you that we have to be mindful to tear down every idol, everything that tries to exalt itself above the kingship of the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. You've got to be able to see that thing and recognize that thing and pull it down by the roots. Say, no, fear, you're not going to sit here. Anxiety you're not gonna sit here this seat belongs to Jesus it belongs to Jesus frustration you're not gonna sit here this place this place this place belongs to the king Oh, frustration you're not gonna sit here this place belongs to Jesus and when Jesus is sitting there with him he brings peace he brings joy he brings joy. He brings healing. Everything that he is, he brings with him. So right where you are, just lift your hands and say, come. And I believe that he's coming right to where you are. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come.
I am blessed and thankful to be here with you once again. We're continuing our series on Facing the Challenges of Life uh, by the book, Facing the Challenges of Life. Apostle Nahum Rosario is the author of the book. I'm Joanne Rosario. I pastor an amazing church here in Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm grateful and thankful to be connected to you in this way. If you want to join us on Sundays in person, we meet at 11 a.m. right now at 3382 Highway 5 in Douglasville, Georgia. Uh, if you want to meet us during the week for our breakthrough prayer, we come together in person to pray at 7 p.m. and it's a powerful time of prayer. We are online, obviously, Tuesday nights at 8 p.m. We do different studies. We get into the Word of God. Uh, Friday mornings, the Power Prayer Call is at 7.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on our Instagram, Rain Fire Church, okay? And so God has blessed us. He's blessed us to be together. He's blessed us to grow together. I'm getting ready to do a, uh, a woman's mentorship, which I have not done one online in a while. It's going to be a two-month total woman mentorship boot camp. And if you want more information about that, make sure to send us an email, info at rainfirechurch.org. Go and make us uh, aware of your desire to be part of the mentorship. And I love the mentorships because it gives me this amazing opportunity to get to know many of you in a more personal way. And a lot of the people that are uh, partners with my ministry or consider themselves uh, sisters uh, on this journey or even spiritual daughters have connected with me through our mentorships because it really is of uh, that time of a more intimate uh, conversation, teaching, mentorship, impartation. Uh, you really, really become a, a part of that inner circle of the family, not just a name in the chat, but uh, you become a person, a face, a personality. I get to know about your hopes, your dreams, your desires, the things that you're believing God for. We stand together. We walk with each other through valleys. I have uh, ladies that are connected to this ministry that have been part of this ministry since I started my blog, before I was pastoring, before I even uh, had a church. And uh, they've been with me since then. And that was when Ariana was a little baby. Ariana is now 12. So we're talking about 12 years, 11, 12 years of, of engagement, of ministry, of pouring into, of family. And it is a blessing to be connected to you in this way. And so we're going to get into the word of God. We are in uh, chapter three of this amazing book, Facing the Challenges of Life. I have the original cover. Uh, if you have the, the new book, it probably, I believe it's like uh, somebody climbing up a mountain. And so um, it is still the same great content. And so don't get thrown off by my cover thinking, oh, I got the wrong book. No, I just have the original. This is the original book. As you can see, it's, you know, pages are a little worn uh, because it has just blessed my life over the years. And it's amazing how when you study certain things or you get into the word of God, uh, how those things will spark strength in your spirit in your heart, in your life. It just really is, it's just powerful. And I'm very grateful for the word of God. I'm grateful for the ministry of my father. I'm grateful for the ministry of my mother. I'm grateful for the ministry of men and women of God that I'm able to connect with, listen to, and be poured into. Because even as a pastor, even as a spiritual leader, it is so important for me to be fed. It's so important for me to be poured into. I face challenges in life just like you do, uh, but by the grace of God, we are now victims we are victorious and we have been saying that a lot this year because yes it has been a challenging year but we are going to continue to trust god and put our faith in the lord because he is faithful he's faithful to his word and no matter what it is that you are going through no matter what it is that you are facing it will work together for your good because you love god and you are called according to his purpose i just challenge you to keep your heart pure i challenge you not to sin against people i i challenge you to release uh hurt release pride release um bitterness over things that may be done towards you that that you may feel like are uh, unjust or unfair release it let it go let go of your past let go of those that have um, that have harmed you and hurt you, uh, things that happened to you when you were a child, things that may be happening to you now. Ask the Lord to help you let it go. And as the Lord helps you let it go, you're just going to find yourself in a place of freedom. You want to be free to hear God. You want to be free to love God. You want to be free to serve God. You want to be free to do the will of the Lord. You know, before you know it, this life is going to be over. And I know that I've been saying that a lot and it's not because I feel like I'm going to die anytime soon, but I do feel like every day we have to live with an awareness as if today 
is our last day. And I don't plan on going anywhere for a long time. I believe and I declare over myself long life, health, strength, and prosperity. And I declare the same thing over you. But if for whatever reason today was my last day, I would want God to be able to say, well done, Joanne. Well done, my good and faithful servant. And that means that he's looking at my heart. He's looking at my, uh, my motivation. He's looking at the things that sometimes other people don't see. He sees the unseen. And so keep your heart in that place and pray that prayer and say, God, purify my heart. Created me a clean heart that I would not sin against you. And I promise you, God is going to continue to do his work in you. And that's the reason why I love to, um, to just encourage you on your journey. I want you to, I want you not to let go. I want you not to give up. I want you to keep pressing uh, and running after God. I had an amazing conversation with, uh, with a son in the faith this week. And I was like, Hey, Hey, where have you been? And I called him. I hadn't seen him. And he said, you know, when you started talking about fasting, it just really, really touched my heart. And I knew that God wanted me to go into a fast. And so I've gone into a seven day fast and I just declare the blessing of God over his life because he's chasing after the Lord. He's chasing after the Lord and God responds to those who chase after after him. He's never going to just leave you hanging. And even if you don't see maybe the answer to your prayer immediately or the result of your prayer and of your fasting immediately, you have to believe and you have to have faith. Okay, there it is. We're going back to faith because faith is a major part of facing the challenges of life. You have to have faith to know that God is moving and God is shifting things according to his will. And even if you don't understand it, you can trust him. Okay. And so father bless the word tonight. Bless Papa Nahum um, as he has given his life, Father God, and poured out himself as an offering before you, Father God, giving us things like this book and his preachings and impartation and all of the teachings even that I have received personally. Father, all of the formation that I have received personally that allows me, Father God, to stand in faith, to stand unmoved, Father, by uh, because of your calling, because of your grace, because of your anointing. Father, I just bless his life. I bless mama's life. I thank you for both of them. I thank you, Father God, that uh, they have just poured into millions around the world, not just me, but millions and millions around the world, Father God, because they have poured out their lives as an offering before you. And so allow this word to just come alive in our spirit. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We're in chapter three and chapter three, the title of chapter three is faith makes you a winner. The first, the first scripture uh, is first John five, four says for whatever is born of God uh, overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith, our faith. It's so important for us to understand that faith is not, uh, faith is not just this, uh, you know, it's not wishful thinking. Faith is not, oh, I wish things would get better. Oh, you know, it, it's not wishful thinking. Faith is, uh, it is a power. Faith is substance. Faith is a spirit. Faith uh, can move mountains. Faith can manifest uh, things that are invisible and make them visible. Faith is a very, very powerful force uh, in the spiritual world. And it is faith that makes you a winner but what is faith and how do you activate faith and how do you become strong in faith and what is the foundation of your faith okay all right it says here faith is one of the most powerful forces in the universe everything in the spiritual world is moved by faith faith is so important because it is one of God's virtues and characteristics God is a God of faith because the Bible records that the formation of the universe was a result of God's faith it was God's faith that caused a world with such a perfect order such as ours to emerge from what couldn't be seen. So when we look at faith, we look at the power of faith, we see in the word of God that God uses faith. He exercises uh, faith. Faith is something that comes from God. It is founded in his word. It is, it is founded in who he is. And the power of faith created the universe. The power of faith created the world. The power of faith created everything that we see. And so we must know how to engage the power of faith because it's faith that makes you a winner. It's faith that makes you an overcomer. And it is through faith that you're able to face the challenges of life. Okay, the next section of this uh, first page says, in the same way, all of life's challenges can yield, can yield before the presence of an active and daring faith. Okay, all of life's challenges can yield. All of life's challenges can 
submit themselves. All of life's challenges uh, have to bow before the presence of an active and daring faith. So what do we have to do to make our faith active and daring is the question. It is impossible to be a conqueror of challenges without having faith. Watch this. Challenges can make you grow in faith or they can make you a failure, depending on how you react to them. And this is so very important. And I think that I, I shared this last Sunday, but when I look at my life and I look at the challenges that I have faced in my life, it is the challenges of life that have made me a woman of God. It is the challenges of life that have caused me to run to God when I had no other option. It is the challenges of life that forced me to believe because I had no other way out. You know how they talk about people in other countries that don't have the advanced technology or medicine uh, or the um, uh, the ability to uh, to get uh, you know, doc doctor's help and things of that nature. They don't have access to the medical things that we have. And it is said that miracle signs and wonders are seen in those countries because people have no choice but to believe God for their healing because either they believe or they die. And they're so desperate and they don't want to die that they believe God, they activate their faith and their faith is powerful enough uh, to cause a manifestation of healing in their lives. This is the same thing that challenges do in our lives the life of a believer even here in the united states where we have so much access to uh to medical help and to financial help and there's so much prosperity everywhere but god will allow you to be in positions where you are between a rock and a hard place god will allow you to be in positions where literally if god does not intervene you will go down in flames your life will go down in flames your ministry will go, go down in flames everything connected to you will go down in flames and you will either have one of two options either you're going to sink or you're going to swim it is when we are in a position where we have no other option but to trust God and believe God because we know that if God doesn't show up we're going to die something within us that that self-preservation that desire uh, to want to live that desire to not want to give up on life that desire rises up out of us and it you know, grabs a hold of the faith of God and it causes you to conquer over those circumstances and over those, uh, those hurdles and those hindrances. So when you face the challenges of life, you're either going to grow in faith or you're going to fail. It's one of those two things. You're going to grow in faith or you're going to fail, but it's going to depend on how you react. And so, you know, I had, um, a situation happen about a week ago and, oh, I was so upset. And the people that were, um, that were, there with me, um, I just kind of, you know, walked away and I said, you know what, I don't mean to be rude, um, but I'll talk to you guys later. And I just kind of walked away because I knew, I knew that at that moment, a lot was going to depend on my reaction. I knew that a lot was going to depend with the words that came out of my mouth. And so I didn't want anything negative to come out of my mouth. I didn't want to complain. I didn't want to get in the flesh of my emotions because my emotions were just like, ah! you know, and, um, and I was just like, mm -mm, no. And I just, I left and I just got quiet and I got before the Lord. And then I called back and I said, you know, and I explained myself, of course, because I didn't want the people that I was with to think that I was being rude. Uh, but I understand at this point, and I'm not saying that I do this perfectly all the time, but I understand at this point, the importance or what it means, uh, what my, you know, how important my reaction is when I'm faced with challenges, because my reaction is going to determine if I fail or if I grow in faith, okay? So the reaction, we have to grow in our reaction to say, okay, God, you cannot lie. God, you're in control. Father, I place my trust in you. God, I'm gonna wait on you. No weapon that is formed against me shall prosper. You know, I am coming out of this. You know, God, God has my back. And so you're able to face that challenge head on because you're placing your trust in the Lord, okay? So our author is saying, do you face challenges with a positive expectancy that one way or another you're going to win or do you feel that sense of desperation before the challenge that you think only comes to defeat and to depress you now when i say having a positive expectation that you're going to win i don't mean having a positive expectation that you're going to win over another person okay um god can have two people that are in a situation and let's say you know 
both of them love God, but both of them are at odds. Okay, let's just say, for example, both people love God, but they are at odds with each other. God can deal with each one of them individually and deal with their hearts individually and put them through a process in individually that it causes them to win as an individual. And what does it mean to win? It doesn't mean that you win over the other person, but what it means is that, that what God works in you, what God does in you, what God does in your heart is going to make you better. It is going to, in the end, work out for your good. So that situation is going to make you stronger. It's going to make you more a person of integrity. It's going to change your life. It's going to draw you closer to the Lord. God is going to work it out in you so that you win because the final product that he produces in your life because of that thing that you're walking through is going to be for your good. And so it's not that you're winning over someone else, but that as an individual in your own personal race, in the end, you will win because you will see God do something amazing in you, in you. And sometimes you'll see a turnaround also in that situation. Okay. Sometimes it may turn out the way that you want it to turn out, but sometimes things don't, don't turn out the way we want them to turn out, does that mean that you lost? No, it doesn't mean that you lost. It just means that there is a bigger plan and a bigger purpose that at the moment you can't see and you have to be able to put your trust in the Lord, okay? Now, I love um, that this chapter breaks faith down in such a beautiful and awesome way. But first, before we get into that, I want to read this passage and it says, what is faith? So go to the section that says, what is faith? Uh, it has been said that faith is positive thinking or having a positive attitude towards life's challenges. Uh, but the true concept of faith goes a lot further than that. Faith has to do with the hope of being able to conquer what seems impossible and being able to conquer things that are invisible and bring them into the natural realm where we can see them. This is why the writer of Hebrews defined faith as the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. The positive thinker, I'm moving down in the text, the positive thinker can only think positive while, uh, while um, the ship sinks, okay? And, or until the ship sinks. We have a little bit of a typo there. But the person of faith will keep with their faith the ship afloat until he safely reaches land. So a positive thinker is going to be able to think positively while things are going well. But at the point that things start to go bad, at the point that the ship begins to sink, the positive thinking goes out the window, okay? Because the positive thinking was associated with things going well. But a person of faith is able to stand in a ship that is sinking and begin to declare the promise of God, begin to put their trust in the Lord, begin to say, God, I know that you will keep me. I know that all things work together for my good and really truly believe it in your heart and your faith will, even though that, that ship has every reason to sink, your faith will keep that ship afloat until God is able to do what he said that he's going to do. And that is a powerful, powerful force that you want to know how to tamp, tap into. Uh, further down uh, in the text, it says, uh, this faith is never passive, but it provides us with the energy to do something to change the situation, okay? So this faith that I'm talking about is never passive, but it provides us with the energy to do something to change the situation. So that doing something may mean praying. That doing something may mean uh, fasting. That doing something may mean, okay, you're a tither, you're a giver, uh, you're struggling financially, you have to figure out how to pay some things and how to handle some things. And you know, you say, God, I'm gonna move on that idea that you gave me. And then your faith, is aggressive and you begin to do what God has told you to do or, or you begin to execute, execute the idea that God has given you and then all of a sudden you realize that your situation is changing because God gave you the power to create wealth, okay? But that faith, as, as it says here, is never passive, but it provides us with the energy, the strength, that faith just kind of comes on the inside of you and says to you, don't give up, come on, keep moving. God is with you, it's going to be all right, okay? Now the next section of uh, 
of the book, uh, go to the section that says faith in God's character. Okay. So when we talk about faith uh, makes you a winner, which is the title of this chapter, what does that mean? What does it mean that faith makes you a winner and faith in what? Okay. And so now that we've talked about a little bit about what faith is, faith is the substance of the thing that is hoped for. It is the evidence of the thing that is not seen. Okay. I see the way, um, Apostle Nahum broke down these sections and each section, I feel like it has given me something to put my anchor, to hook my anchor onto, okay? So when I'm talking about faith, I'm gonna take my anchor and I'm gonna put my anchor first into the character of God. So first, I'm going to put my faith into the character of God. I'm going to, I'm gonna connect my faith to the character of God, okay? What is your concept of God? The concept or opinion that you have about God will in great measure determine your ability to believe him. So who do you believe God is? When you think about God, what is he to you? Who is he to you? He's proven himself to me over and over again. So when I think about God, I think about someone that loves me. When I think about God, I think about someone that takes care of me. I think about someone who provides for me. I think about somebody who protects me. I think about someone um, that, you know, that shows up at impossible moments and make things, makes things that I thought impossible become possible because I can give you an example of each and every one of those things that I said that I believe God is because these are things that I personally experienced in my relationship with God. Countless times where I needed a financial miracle, in times where I was not working, in times where I did not have income, in times uh, where I didn't know um, what was gonna happen with the church, in time, you know, all of these different moments or hardships or, or, or you know, troubles that I faced and I didn't know what I was going to do and I was able to put my faith in the Lord and he proved himself. And so because I know his character, I understand who he is. First, I anchor myself in his character, okay? Now, down at the third paragraph under faith in God's character, one, two, three, uh, it says, what determines a person's value is his integrity. God's character has integrity in every aspect. This is what assures us that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His character is distinguished by the infallibility and flawlessness of his words and deeds. Every person that has faith in God's stable character can believe his promises because they have the assurance that God will always be present to help them overcome everything that they face on their journey. So it's about the character of God. It's about the consistency of God. It's about knowing who God is and anchoring yourself and your faith in God's character. What impacts me most about God's character is his love and goodness. And watch this, God is infinitely good. Being that only, oh, he's, God is an infinitely good being that only manifests his judgment when the unrighteousness of man prevents the manifestation of his goodness. And this impacted me because basically the character of God is infinitely without measure, without limit, good, okay? The character of God is good without limit. The character of God is good without limit. And the goodness of God is only hindered when the unrighteousness of man hinders the manifestation of the goodness of God. So if a person or, 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 or a or a nation or a community or a family is not experiencing the goodness of God, it is possible, it is possible. It's not always the case, but it is possible that there may be unrighteousness that is hindering the manifestation of the goodness of God. Now, we also know because of the word of the Lord, example Job, that sometimes the righteous experience seasons of turmoil and of, and of and of storm and it's not connected to their being unrighteousness but sometimes it is connected so let's not judge when people are going through but when you're going through uh go to god and say god show me reveal to me help me understand you know what it is that is uh that is happening in my life and you'll be able to see and understand what is happening what is happening because he'll reveal it to you he'll reveal it to you Faith operates in the revelation that God is love and he totally 
identifies with our afflictions and sufferings. If you want to grow in faith, then ardently study the four gospels where God reveals his true character as a good father through the person of his son, Jesus Christ. Because God in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, God manifests his heart and his love and his character through the life of Jesus Christ, through the person of his son, Jesus Christ, okay? So first, we place our faith in God's character. Next, we place our faith in God's faithfulness. Another outstanding trait of God's character is his faithfulness. When we say that someone is faithful, we mean that he is consistent, stable, and responsible in his words and actions. If there is true faithfulness, there are no irresponsible changes in the person that has given his word, love, and dedication to another person. So when a person is truly faithful, their, uh, their actions don't change, their attitudes don't change when they've given their word, when they have committed themselves, okay? God is faithful because the character of God demands it. He doesn't change because of feelings or because of the circumstances that present themselves at the moment. The Bible says that God doesn't change and that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Go down in the page, it says, Paul said to Timothy, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, he cannot deny himself. So if God stopped being faithful, he would stop being God because he himself would be denying a vital part of his character. And so we can place our faith in God's faithfulness because God's faithfulness is connected to his character. And even when we are, uh, we, when we are faithless, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. So if God stops being faithful to us, then he would stop being God because he would be denying a part of his character. It would make him a liar. And if he lies, he cannot be God. And so we can trust his character. We can trust uh, his faithfulness. And then next, uh, we can place our faith in his power and his ability. So we put our faith in God's character. This is even before we get to his word. We can put our faith in his character. We can put our faith in his faithfulness. And thirdly, we can put our faith in his power and ability. Okay? It is necessary, and this is the second sentence in the first paragraph, because I want you to follow along with me. It is necessary to know that God is able to do. God is able. God is able. God is able. God is able. Can somebody just praise God for his ability? God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or imagine according to Ephesians 3 verse 20. Nothing is impossible for God because he has the power to do all things. The word power means the ability to execute an action or work effectively. What differentiates God and the pagan gods of this world is that he is omnipotent in his person within God resides the power that has been, is, and will be. So inside of God resides the power that created the universe. Inside of God resides the power that created man. Inside of God resides the power that he used uh, to create the oceans and the stars and the moon and the sun and the planets. Within God, is all the power that has ever existed and that will ever exist. And so we can place our faith in his what? His power and his ability. Faith that overcomes challenges, back in the book, shouldn't be founded in our weaknesses and inability as humans, but in the power and the ability of God to do all that he has promised in his word. When Jesus encountered a man whose son was being tormented by a demon, the man said to Jesus, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus's answer was what we've been talking about in this chapter. If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Mark 9, verse 22 and 23. This man didn't understand that the solution to his challenge wasn't being hindered because Jesus didn't have the power to heal his son, but because of his own lack of faith at that moment. So, this is about our faith. This is not about God's lack of power or his lack of ability when we don't see certain things coming together, okay? Now, obviously, in this passage, uh, the father was asking something of Jesus that is the will of God. So you have to know what is the will of God. 
but so so right now let's just talk about the things that we know is god's will okay deliverance is god's will healing is god's will his bible uh, his his word says it and so with the things that we know are god's will we can stand flat-footed and we can anchor ourselves in god's character in god's faithfulness and in god's power and ability to fulfill his word okay the third paragraph under faith is uh faith in his power and ability says in the same way we often face challenges and forget that the solution is not in whether God can or can't give us victory. The solution is in us believing in his power and ability to do which, uh, that which seems impossible to us. God is so good that he doesn't even always require a perfect faith uh, form in us. Uh, but just that we admit our unbelief. So God, is not, God doesn't need, us, need our faith to be perfect. But even when you're struggling in faith, you can say, God, I believe, but I'm, I'm also struggling. So watch this. I underline this specifically. Uh, it says, let's do like this father of the demon possessed did, who asked Jesus to help his unbelief. The power of Jesus did two things. First, it helped the unbelief of the father so that he could believe. And then it completely healed his son from the oppression of the demon. And so when the man responded to Jesus, he said, I believe, help my unbelief. And so the power of Jesus and the ability that was in Jesus first touched the man and touched his faith so that he could believe. He, he said, he basically was saying, I believe, but I feel like there's more unbelief than belief. But I do believe, but please help the part that doesn't believe. Help my unbelief. And God helped his unbelief. The power of God helped his unbelief and then also delivered his son from being demon possessed. That's powerful. So after we trust in God's character, we trust in his faithfulness, we trust and we put our faith in his ability and in his power. We can put faith in God's willingness, in his willingness, okay? Uh, it is one thing, we're reading, it is one thing to believe in someone's ability to do something, but it is something else to believe in his willingness to do it. It is nearly impossible to find a Christian that doesn't believe that God is able to do all things. We all sing of, speak of, preach of and exalt the virtues of a God of power. So then why is it that when we face the challenges of life, we have no faith to prevail? The reason is that faith is not only founded on the power of God, but also in his willingness to do what we ask. I want to illustrate what I just said with a story from the Bible in Matthew 8. A leper came to Jesus and said, if you're willing you can make me clean. This man was no different than modern Christians that know that God can do things for them, but they're not sure if he wants to do it for them. Reflect on this. On this, What do you think about a father that has the ability to rescue his son from a great problem, but refuses to help him? We would say that this father has a hardened heart and that he, that he is insensitive to his son's situation. Thank God that he is not that way. His answer to his children is the same one Jesus gave the leopard. The leopard, I am willing. I am willing. So right now, in the name of Jesus, I want you to think about yourself. I want you to think about the things that you're believing God for. But I also want you to think about those things that you are believing God for, but you feel unworthy. You say, well, you know, will God do it? Can God do it? Well, I believe God can do it, but will he do it for me? And I pray that the Holy Spirit would be able to touch your heart in such a way that you would understand and know that God is not just able, but God is willing, that God is willing to do amazing things in your life and that you would be able to really uh, set your faith, set your faith in God's character, his faithfulness, his ability and his power, and also his willingness, okay? So we've been already through four different things that we can set our faith on. And now we're getting to faith in his word. Okay, the Bible is the book that reveals the true character of God. Everything that we've said about God's character up until now, we've learned it from the revelation of God in his word. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Then what happens to thousands of Christians that hear the word of God week after week and still live defeated lives? It is that we can't have faith in the word of God unless we first have faith in the integrity of the giver of the word. 
It isn't the consonants or the vowels that people use in their words that give value to their word. What gives value to a person's word is the integrity of the character of the person speaking. Powerful. Man's true value is not in the words that he speaks, but in the words he fulfills. If I have faith in someone's words, it is because that person has proved to me once and again that they don't lie to me and that as much as they can help it, they will fulfill everything they promised me. That is why I have absolute faith in God's word because I have more than absolute faith in the God of the word. So I believe God's word because I believe in the God that is giving me his word. Because the God that is giving me his word has proved himself over and over and over again. This is one of the reasons I believe why reflection is so important. Joanne, what is reflection? Thinking. Sometimes you gotta just, you know, remember when the saints used to say, you know, sometimes you gotta just think about where the Lord has brought you from. That is a powerful exercise. It is a powerful exercise for you to sit down at lunch and for you to sit there and begin to think about the faithfulness of God, the character of God, the times that God has been there for you, that time that he healed your body, that time that he sent a, a financial miracle, that time that he healed your relationship, that time that he restored things between you and your child, that time that he turned an impossible situation around for your good. When you think about, you know, as they used to say, when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he has done for me, my soul cries out hallelujah. My soul uh, is renewed in faith, not just in the word of God, but in the character of the God that is giving his word to me. That is something that you can anchor yourself in and it's powerful. Do you want to be equipped for all the challenges that life presents? Have faith in the word of God knowing that it is the result of a faithful God that has integrity and who can never fail or lie. It is the infallible ca character of my God which gives power to his word. It is the infallible character of my God which gives power to his word. When we know this reality, then we will understand that not one of God's words is void of power. Not one word that God has spoken to you, not one word that God has spoken over you is void of power. It doesn't matter what anybody does. It doesn't matter what anybody says. It doesn't matter what anybody's opinion is. Not one word that God has spoken over you is empty of power. It is full of power. Wow. No wonder Isaiah 55 11 says, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Every time I read the scripture, I think of God's word being like a boomerang. You know, like, have you seen in the movies? I mean, I've never seen a boomerang in real life, but you know, when, when, you know, somebody has, you know, one of those boomerangs that kind of looks like a, kind of looks like an arrow and they take the boomerang and they throw the boomerang and eventually that boomerang comes back. That's how I see the word of the Lord. I see that the word of the Lord is released over us and I see that boomerang and that word, you know, just going around, going around until literally it accomplishes what God said it's going to accomplish. And it comes back to God being able to report and say, God, I did what you said needed to be accomplished and needed to be done. There are words that are boomeranging over you and they're going to boomerang over you all the days of your life. And as long as we keep anchoring our faith and having that active faith, those words will be able to manifest because that word is going to keep hovering over you. And God, this is the thing about God. God allows those words. He, see, God doesn't sit up and say, oh, Joanne has not fulfilled my purpose in 15 years. And so I'm going to withdraw my promise. I'm going to withdraw that prophetic word that I released. I'm going to take back. God is not an Indian giver. It was funny because I was thinking the other day and I was just like, wow, like I was goofing around till I was 30. Like I loved God, but God didn't have my, my all. God did not have my, my complete and total yes in every single area of my life. It was after I turned 30 that I, I really kind of hit this corner. Was I perfect after turning 30? No, I wasn't. 
but I was committed. There was a different level of commitment. There was a different level of hunger. There was a different level of, you know, okay, God, I'm going to do things your way. And so in those first 30 years, when I was cutting up in college and, you know, cutting up while, on, you know, on tour or whatever the case may be and trying to do things my own way and trying to have my own goals and my own dreams and my own this and my own that and being disobedient to my parents and, and, and whatever, being disobedient to God. During that time, God could have been like, you know what? Forget it. I changed my mind about you, Joanne. I'm taking my word back. But if he took his word back, then he would be a liar, which is against his character. So God let that word, his word, hover over me like a boomerang. And every single day that I had a breath in my body was a new day that I had the opportunity to line up with that word. And the day came. What you see in me now is a life that is lined up with the word of God. That's all you see in me. And so God in his grace and in his mercy allowed that word to hover. He never took it back. And so if a person dies and the word of the Lord was not fulfilled, it wasn't because God took his word back, but it was because that person never lined themselves up with the word of the Lord. I declare over you and I declare over me that we will not go to our grave without 1000% cooperating with the word that God has spoken over us. And we will have those words that God has spoken over us, be able to go back to God saying, I finished my assignment. I fulfilled what you sent me to do. That's powerful. That is powerful. I believe that this is our, oh no, we have two, much, two more, okay? We have faith in God. We can put uh, our faith in God's covenant. Okay, the word of God is so powerful because in it we find a God that has made a covenant with men. It would be sufficient to believe in the word of God because we believe in the character, integrity, goodness, and faithfulness of God. God not wanting to leave a shadow of doubt in our minds concerning his willingness to help us has committed himself to man through covenants. God's covenants were never the idea of man. They were a result of the there were a result of the good character of a compassionate God extending his hand towards a race of rebellious and lost individuals. And so understand this. So God, uh, we can trust his faithfulness, we can trust his character, we can trust his integrity, his goodness. We can trust all of these things about God, the fact that he never changes. We can trust the God that gives us his word. But in order to banish all doubt, God started to make covenant with man. And so when he came to Abraham, he made a covenant with Abraham. He made covenant with Noah. He made covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He made a cut, like he, he went a step beyond. And so, okay, it's, it's who I am is enough. Okay. God is saying who I am is enough, but just in case any, there's any doubt, any doubt in your mind that I will fulfill my word, I'm going to make a deal with you. Okay. Which I call covenant which means I'm going to give you my promise. It's like going into a business deal with somebody and they are promising to do something. They're promising that they're going to execute something according to that contract. That is what God's covenant is, okay? These are the promises which are sealed by God's own hand and affirmed uh, by the mouth of God that has never lied that make us pregnant with faith to be able to conquer any challenges that we might faith, face. In the natural aspect of things, we know of men that take other men to court for not fulfilling the conditions of a written or signed contract between the two. If a contract written by men has such power, how much more power will the covenant that God has made with his children, which is signed by the blood of his precious son, Jesus, have? So the contract, the covenant that God has made with his people is not just signed by man, but it is signed with the blood of Jesus. It's an eternal covenant. And every single day, we have the ability to fulfill our part in the covenant so that the blessing of the covenant can be activated in our lives. The only condition that we have to meet for this covenant to be activated in our lives is to keep our side of the contract or 
agreement, okay? Lastly, I believe, yes, lastly, we place our faith in the wonderful love of God. The greatest assurance that I could have to be more than a conqueror in this life is to know that God loves me with an incomparable love. This love is so wonderful that it moved God to make the greatest sacrifice of love and give the thing dearest to his heart for a lost humanity that doesn't always appreciate the manifestation of his love. God is the only one that loves without first being loved. God is the only one that loves without first being loved. This divine love is most difficult for the, the human mind to comprehend. How do you define something if you have nothing to compare it with? What does this love have to do with my having faith uh, to face challenges? If God could love me so much that even though I was a sinner, he sent his only son to die for me, then what won't he do for me now that I've been reconciled through his blood? No wonder Paul marveled at the magnitude of this love and said, for if we, for, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. We have been reconciled to God through the love of Jesus Christ. We have uh, received the greatest sacrifice of love that's in the death and the resurrection of Jesus. We can put our faith in God's character, his integrity, uh, his power, his ability, his willingness, his love, his covenant, his word. <laughs> there is so much that God has given us just within himself that we can place our faith, our faith in. And these are all things that when we face challenges, we should be able to go back to the storehouse of our knowledge of God and be able to say, God, this is a trying time. This is a hard time. I don't know what's going to happen, but God, I'm coming back to what I know about you. I'm coming back to your character. I'm coming back to your faithfulness. I'm coming back, Lord God, to the covenant of your word. I'm coming back to your covenant. I'm coming back to your ability and your power. And I'm coming back to your willingness, knowing that you are willing to do what you've said that you're going to do. And knowing these things should allow such a peace to just explode in our heart. And that peace and that strength should help us to stand in the midst of the storm. God doesn't want you. God does not want for you to be tossed every which way. He doesn't want you to be destroyed in the storm. He wants you to be able to stand in the storm placing your trust in him, knowing that he is faithful, that he is constant, that he is never changing, and that he is going to make a way out for you. And so I just declare that this word comes alive in your life today, right now, tonight. I believe and I declare that this word comes alive in you and gives you the faith to stand firm in the midst of your valley, in the midst of your storm. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I love you. Be blessed. Have a great night. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for sharing me. Make sure that you're following me on social media. Uh, go to um, Instagram, Joanne Rosario underscore, and, and follow me. Make sure that you follow my YouTube channel, uh, Pastor Joanne Rosario. Uh, make sure that you follow the church, uh, Rainfire Church, on Instagram. Uh, and if you want to email us, go to our website, rainfirechurch.org, and send us an email. And uh, we want to pray for you. We want to cover you. Uh, if you want to be a member of this church, either online or in the house, send us an email. Let us know. And for those of you that sow and give and tithe uh, to this ministry, we declare that Rainfire is a 100% tithing church. Uh, Rainfire Church Maranatha is a 100% a giving church. We're a generous church. Every person that is connected to this ministry tithes and brings their offering. Uh, to this ministry. If this is your home church, then you uh, sow your tithe here. Uh, if you have a home church, you sow your tithe there and you sow offerings into this ministry whenever the Lord places it on your heart to do so. 
And uh, all of the ways to give are right there on the screen. Uh, so you can give uh, easily. You're able to give quickly. And we just declare the blessing of God upon you and upon your family. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you. Until next time, believe and trust that you can make it through any challenge that you are facing because God is with you. Be blessed.